Before I start the video, I have to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor. I know that sometimes when we're high, or even just sober, we always try to find something to occupy our minds. Well today, I have found the solution to that problem. If you always like reading Where's Waldo books and trying to find them in the mix with hundreds of other drawn characters on each page, then you're going to love this book. This is the stoner's version of Where's Waldo, and it's called Where's My Dealer. It's a stoner activity book where you find the hidden dealers in each page amongst the psychedelic artwork. The artwork made it in this book was created by 20 different artists, and some of the dealers you have to find were inspired by the real-life weed dealers. These are some examples of the artwork you'll find in the book. This one was inspired by an artist friend's hallucination whilst on ayahuasca in South America. This artwork is meant to be symbolic of a bad trip, someone having a bad time on drugs. And I think this one is really cool. It was inspired by the stoned ape theory in which I did a video on. The dealers you will have to look for are all the different types of dealers you will find in the real world, including the sketchy, the festival dealer, the hippie, and more. There is so much detail on each and every artwork. I know it's going to take you a long time to find every dealer on each page. I know it took me a while to find them. So if you're looking for a nice fun present for your stoner friends, or anyone for that matter, go to Amazon and buy this book. The link to purchase will be in the description box below. Thank you, and let's get started with the video. My first experience with the mushroom. Along with two friends of mine, both first-timers, I backpacked two days into a coastal wilderness area we had never been to before. Beach hiking on a black sand beach under sunny skies was a treat those first two days. We felt lucky to be traveling under such nice conditions since it was quite early in the season and rain was a likely event. On the evening of the second day, we set up camp by a river, pitching our tent on the sand back by the green edge of the lush forest. The plan was to dose the next morning. We did not discuss the upcoming experience much, but our firelit faces betrayed flickers of anticipation. My expectations coming to this point were unambiguously positive. I had much history with marijuana, which I have a peculiar sensitivity to, and had patiently prepared myself for an eventual encounter with mushrooms. In hindsight, I see two misconceptions I took into the trip with me. First, I think there is a general opinion that, in the spectrum of common entheogens, mushrooms fall immediately above marijuana. Having not heard any detailed account of the possible range of effects, I carried the notion in my head that I was in for something only slightly more intense than a very strong marijuana high. The second fallacy I brought with me was that pot would only make a mushroom trip come on quicker. I wasn't aware of the possibility of a synergistic effect. When we awoke at sunrise on the third day to dark gray skies, drizzling rain and cold wind, I should have perhaps treated it as an omen for the trip ahead. We ate a small breakfast of granola and soy milk, then huddled beneath a small driftwood shelter. Each of us ingested 3.5 grams of psilocybe cubensis, commenting on the extremely foul taste. We cleaned our camp up, then waited for the effects to make themselves known. I split from my friends who wanted to go out near the ocean. The rain had increased to a light shower, and I retreated a little ways under the shelter of the trees. I was aware of a stony effect and heightened interest in the lovely greenery around me. I bent down close to a small patch of tiny plants, moss, and ferns. As I came down into this miniature scene, the delicate life forms seemed to swell into grand and beautiful versions of themselves. There seemed to be an entire world happening down in the bushes. I began to hear a strange music coming from, it seemed to me, the tiny plant system and my immediate surroundings. The sound of the rain dripping and circulating through the green botanical city made an almost digital sounding high pitch oscillation. To my ears came plant music, oddly electronic. The scene took on a strange, futuristic light, as if I was looking at a small hydroponic grow tank with artificial light shining from above and the sound of computerized sprayers hissing in the background. The plants themselves seemed half artificial, genetically designed experiments or even computer generated images. This imagery brought with it some cognitive development along a similar theme of artificial reality. The mushroom seemed to slightly distance my awareness from my sensory perception, and I began to think of reality as a fearfully complex game of virtual reality. Each plant seemed merely to be the physical expression of the algorithm for a plant. Every aspect of reality was simply programmed to look and behave with certain properties, just as a programmer would code a 3D world with plants, trees, running water, etc. The intention of an ideal virtual reality is to be absolutely convincing, and it obviously was but things looked the same as they always had. 
These were internal ponderings rather than experiential awakenings. I was pulled out of this mind trip, however, approximately an hour after dosing, due to the now severe case of nausea that had been creeping up since the beginning. The acute sensation brought me into a darker, grouchy emotional state as I stalked through the forest looking for a place to throw up. I had stamped out for about 10 minutes wondering what to do when my friends appeared on the lookout for me. They were also experiencing nausea and suggested we go smoke some pot to kill the feeling. It sounded like the best idea to me. We smoked a bowl under the shelter and that is when time, space, and my mind joined hands for a final ring around the rosy. My friends walked off to explore while I stared out at black sky, black rain, black sand, and the pounding black ocean. The digital water music I heard before exploded into a thunderous techno of crashing bass waves and a million glassy raindrop tones. I was cold and wet and decided outdoors in a downpour was the last place I wanted to be. I headed for the small three-man tent, pulled my shoes and jacket off at the entrance, and crawled into the bright, cocoon-like interior. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down, and I landed hard. For the next few hours, two fundamental mindsets fought for control of my consciousness. The first mindset was my ego sense, the opinion that I was a human named Josh with some 20 years worth of memories, who had consumed a psychedelic substance and was experiencing a corresponding trip. That part of my mind suffered a terrifying emotional roller coaster in the tent, beating myself up for being so stupid as to ingest a substance I was not, it seemed, the least bit prepared for. The effects at this point were more intense than I could have possibly imagined. I rolled around in my sleeping bag, alternating between hysteria and tears. I saw the red-edged tent door flapping in the wind and thought it was a blood-soaked image of a demon tormenting me. The cause of all this suffering was the emergence of another fundamental mindset. To the frightened homo sapien in the tent, it was a total reality loss. Very simply, I became aware that the universe is a dream, infinitely long, endlessly varied, and eternally cycling. This awareness came in the form of an amnesia, that is a re-remembering of what was once forgotten. I remembered the true nature of reality and time with absolute certainty. I remembered the last time I had been on this beach, in this tent, scared shitless. I remembered it from previous rotation on the wheel of time. Consciousness and reality merged into what amounted to a pure and continuous deja vu. My terrified ego desperately relived memories of my life and recent past as evidence of their existence. But all these images were fading invisibly away as dream memories soon do upon awakening. Alone in the tent, solipsism, the belief that only the self creates reality, reigns supreme. I stared at the brand names of my shoes and sandals, baffled that I could come up with such realistic names. In a very real sense, I realized I was the cosmic programmer who had carefully designed and created a totally convincing experience made of props, trees, animals, buildings, characters, family, friends, lovers, and a plot line, joys, sorrows, etc. Up to this point, the current episode of the Cosmic Life game had been sort of a coming of age number, maybe transitioning into a love story. I was the writer, the director, the star, the audience. Of course, in order to be really interesting, the last step in the setting and motion of this vast, cosmic drama was the removal of my memory of having created it. A dream is, obviously, the perfect model for what I am describing. As I figured it, the mushroom was merely a unique key planted in reality as a mechanism for waking up from the dream. In my current state, I was out of time, in a singularity of sorts, where I could see the universe for what it truly was. One of my friends returned, soaked to the skin through his entirely waterproof outfit. He joined me in the tent, and I puzzled over who this person really was. I didn't know if we were sharing the experience and he had discovered the same ultimate truth that I had, or if he was part of the dream. After acting distant and being rather incommunicative, I finally started a conversation that seemed to perfectly justify the first possibility. It seemed that everything my friend said was confirmation that he did have the same awakening. The same singularity that made my solitary hours seem like an infinitely repeating nightmare now made our conversations go in loops. The same five minute period of time seemed to loop over and over again as we made identical comments and identical gestures. Again, deja vu. Eventually, my other friend returned to the tent after running all over the area. It was about four or five hours after we had dosed, and we were all coming down. At some point, I had reconnected with consensus reality and was left only with a great relief that I was back. We smoked some more bud, and it only relaxed me further. 
I don't think I discussed the intensity of my trip until some days later. We waited out the downpour and came out to clearing skies that evening. I felt very refreshed and peaceful after such a tumultuous day. We hiked all the way back the next day. While under the influence of the mushrooms, I swore that I would never touch them again. Afterwards, having returned to my previous state, I questioned the experience critically. My main obstacle was in discarding my two misconceptions about mushrooms. In comparing my trip with those of my friends and everyone else I've talked to, my experience was unique and infinitely more intense. At that time, I couldn't reconcile what happened to me with what should have happened. Through experimentation and later trips, I've determined that it is the mixing of marijuana and mushrooms that produces the mind-blowing trip. Due to my abnormal sensitivity to pot, psilocybin actually activates the marijuana. Since that first shroom, I've recontacted that singularity from just pot alone. Without any bud, I have the standard shroom trip, beautiful, inspiring, unambiguously positive. I wonder if I'll ever have the courage to intentionally mix psilocybin and THC to have that intense trip again. Even though it was a terrifying experience of ego death, it has been a fundamental force in my life and spiritual thought processes. In the terms of William James, this experience continues to be absolutely authoritative over me. That is, even after returning to ordinary reality, I know that what I experienced was true and is still in effect at this moment. I know I will inevitably find myself back there again, on the beach, as time plays ring around the rosy, into the infinite future. My mindset wasn't the greatest. I told myself that I couldn't let my anxious, sleep-deprived state affect the psychedelic experience that I, my girlfriend E, and two other friends, W and C, had planned for this evening. I have had one other experience with DPT at a low dose of 25 to 30 milligrams and had a somewhat mild, but very fun trip. My dose was 70 milligrams on this day, and it was absolutely bewildering. 70 milligrams of DPT HCL, for lack of a better term, blew my mind. The open eye visuals were almost too intense to comprehend and accurately describe, and the head trip was crushingly intense. I am a somewhat experienced psychonaut, and I have taken more pleasure drugs than I care to mention, but as for anything remotely psychedelic, my list goes as follows. Mushrooms, LSD, ketamine, DMT, DXM, if it counts, marijuana, I don't smoke regularly at all, MDMA, 4-MMC, mephedrone, methalone, you get the idea, and my aforementioned experience with low-dose DPT. I insufflate my measured dose of 50 milligrams, then take another good-sized bump that I assumed was about 10 milligrams. That turned out to be closer to 20. I wasn't concerned with the inaccurate measurement because people have told me to start with doses of 100 milligrams. We all dosed except for W, who just wanted a trip set. So we begin to hike up the hill trail to find ourselves a spot to watch the sunset and look at the beautiful trees and rolling hills. Five minutes in, I'm already at a solid plus, beginning to see enhanced colors. I could feel my heart start to pound, blood pressure rise, and my anxiety build slightly. So I utilize a breathing relaxation exercise as I walk up the steep trail. I close my eyes and breathe deeply and slowly as I feel my mind begin to drift. I could tell that this wasn't going to be an everyday experience. I was really in for a ride. 20 to 30 minutes in, I'm starting to trip hard. I'm somewhere between a 2 plus and a 3 plus already, and we haven't even hiked up to our desired location yet. A man jogs by us and nods his head, and I had a lot of trouble formulating words. I managed to mumble some distorted greeting just after he passed us. The ground begins to crawl with distortions. The tall dried grass seemed to be moving with the kind of animation that only tryptamines can give. I'm still feeling anxious, and at this point realize that in a matter of minutes, this chemical will completely crush me, and there's nothing I can do about it. I hug E, then begin to get lost in this emerging world of hallucinations. The visual world begins to shake back and forth quickly, shapes distort, and my body feels very odd. My current state reminds me a lot of coming up on a smoke dose of DMT, but a lot slower. I tell C that I'm beginning to trip hard. I feel kind of cold due to the wind and the fact that I didn't have a sweater, though C and W later insist that it was about 70 degrees, and I start to shiver. This had happened to me years ago on LSD and led to a somewhat unpleasant, jaw-grinding experience. 30 to 40 minutes in. At this point, my memory gets kind of fuzzy. 
We make it up to the top of a hill with a beautiful view and a nice tree to sit under. At this point, the trees and other vegetation seem fully animate, complete with swirling complex colors. I realize that I am tripping harder than I ever have in my life, including my 6 gram potent mushroom trip, and yes, in a way I was tripping harder than a breakthrough dose of DMT. I realize that I definitely was not ready for an experience like this, but I have to ride it out. Besides, I don't think anybody could really be ready for something like this, but this definitely wasn't the right day and mindset for an experience of this magnitude. 35 to 75 minutes in, this is where I start to plateau. For moments, I was at a complete ego death, possibly four plus. I remembered scattered events and specific hallucinations, but not the order at which any occurred. I recall being extremely confused, shivering on the hillside lying on E's lap, transfixed upon the beautiful landscape. I really wish I had a sweater. The trees in the distance were swirling freely, as if they were puddles of paint being stirred in a fractalesque pattern. Just adjacent to the swirling trees, on a bare hill, I begin to see shapes emerge from the texture in the landscape. I see small faces in everything, which is normal for me on any trip to mean, but this got a lot crazier. In the texture, I saw a group of MC Escher-like lizards. If you've seen the lithograph reptiles by Escher sometime in the 1940s, the lizards were of the exact shape. The lizards were geometrically linked together and moving around freely. Throughout my entire plateau, all the tall brown grass seemed to have thorns and looked somewhat menacing, and I was seeing a lot of fractals and things. It seems that every swirling color swirled in the same pattern. At some point a bit later, I think, I recall walking down a path and seeing a colorful aura lifting above the dry grass on the sides of the trail. The aura rose up at least 10 feet and was smoke-like in texture, though moved very slowly. All of my visuals were absolutely astonishing. Honestly, they were kind of overwhelming at times, but very beautiful nevertheless. My head trip was what was truly overwhelming, and my negative mindset defiantly manifested itself. I spent a lot of time thinking about my past opiate dependency, even though I've been off of opiates for about a year. I wasn't talked to by some mystical figure. I didn't feel touched by a divine voice. I was just in my head, intensely introspective. It seems like there would be five minute cycles of total immersion in the experience, then a minute or two reality check. 75 minutes and onward. So after we came down, we headed back into town, got some food, then hung out. I really was the only one of the three trippers that had such an intense experience. E only took about 50 milligrams, and she said she didn't trip any harder than her previous 25 milligram dose. And C took a little less than I did, and didn't trip hard at all, though he weighs about 60 pounds more than I do. C said the next time he wanted to do about 120 milligrams. This was definitely the most intense psychedelic experience of my entire life. I was in the wrong mindset, and not prepared for the experience. The intensity of it caught me off guard since I've heard it really doesn't get too crazy until about 100 milligrams, but I really should have expected an intense experience. I still have a bit of it left, but probably won't do it again until I prepared myself. I will go for either a higher or lower dose because it seems like there really are two faces to the chemical. My first trial at the lower dose of 25 to 30 milligrams was a mushroom-like experience, and I think a higher dose would be a behind closed eyelids DMT-like experience. For most of my trip at this dosage, I could barely stand, but wanted to be outside, which implies that at a higher dose in the proper setting would provide an experience similar to DMT, which isn't for outside. I don't regret this trip. It was amazing, but it caught me off guard. Oh, and by the way, it fucked up my nose, so make sure you don't snort it with both nostrils, only one, because it could restrict breathing. If you wouldn't mind, please give this video a like if you're enjoying it so far, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'd really appreciate it. Comment down below your ego death experience. I'd love to hear it. Don't want to interrupt too long, so let's get back to the video. Completely melted into the experience, this was so much stronger than any other hit. Holy shit. Lived many lifetimes, got crippled with addiction, the world turned gray. I forgot about my life, my existence. Life was a repetitive blur. Severely hallucinating on the way to the toilet and back, reality lost any sense of logic. 
I was walking through endless rooms in my flat. I completely lost touch with time. I wanted it to end. It was too intense. I lost touch with my life entirely. Nothing seemed to matter. It was pointless loops that I couldn't get out of. I finally understood addicts. I thought I was an addict, that my friends, family, and colleagues would find it, that I'd be judged. That faded when I realized I wanted them to know. I wanted help. I wanted this to end. I thought it had been days, that I wasn't showing up for work. I forgot everything about myself. I had to say my name, my trip sitter's name, the name of the company I work at, again and again, along with thank you, I'm sorry, it's okay, in order to come back. It was just pieces of a puzzle. My life was fragmented. I try to remember food and water. I remember I needed those. I didn't remember why. Intensely hallucinating while talking to TS, my desk was moving around the room back to its first position. I wasn't in reality anymore. I was dropping in and out. Life was glitching intensely. Saw just how ludicrous life was. Going to work, coming back, looking for a mate. Endless cycles, repeating ad nauseum. They sped up into movement was all that was left. There was no life left, just a blur. I forgot who I was. I lived a thousand lifetimes in 20 minutes. Confronted with the temporary nature of existence, I thought that I could only live the moments I was on DMT. I thought I was going to work, coming back, making money, seeing people, but the only moments I saw was when I did the DMT. I thought weeks had passed, that I stopped going outside, that my friends would soon be aware of my addiction. Then this shifted to me being okay with that. I couldn't get out. There was no exit. I wanted serious help. I wanted the loops to stop. I thought I stumbled on this drug as a solution, but instead, I appreciate what addicts have to go through to quit. I struggled to get out. I tried for a while to return. I just wanted my life back. Eventually, the effects faded, but I was hallucinating intensely. I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was stuck. I was conscious, but I knew I had to break the loop, a non-existent one, of taking DMT. I told TS this needed to stop. My assumption was that weeks had passed, that we had done it many times already, and I didn't have the mental fortitude to stop the next one, that it's inevitable. I'd fall back in. I had smoked salvia once before and felt some threshold effects, but this time, I planned on breaking through and getting level 5 effects. After the first hit, I felt the familiar sensation of salvia overtaking me. It's possible that I smoked another bowl after that, but I cannot be sure. What I felt then was this. Everything went black. I might have shut my eyes. It was a feeling of rebirth, a near-death experience. As though all of reality had been a play on stage, and suddenly I realized that I was on stage. Suddenly I realized that I was in an entirely different dimension, perhaps hell. I had a waking awareness that I was in a new reality, the reality, somewhere outside of the dimension of the living. Only I didn't perceive this as it really was, a drug-induced near-death or out-of-body experience. I didn't realize I'd taken a drug. I could still feel the grass underneath my palms, but I didn't know what it was. Whatever it was, I was aware of being a part of it, of literally being attached to it, grown into it. It just became another part of the dimension I was in, a tattered artifact of the now-forgotten reality of the day-to-day. -day. I lost all contact with the physical reality around me, and indeed, the reality of my own existence itself. I felt as though I had entered the ever-present spirit realm. My mind tried to grasp onto this fact, to make sense of what was happening, but for a few minutes, that was impossible. This was not a surface high. The ego loss was total. I was totally out of my mind in every way. Then, once I regained my senses enough to realize that I was under the influence of Salvia Divinorum, the whole experience was so alien and terrifying that I wanted the feelings to end right then. I wanted to be back in the comfortable reality of my home, but of course, I couldn't stop the trip. The more I resisted, the more I panicked, as I had the retrospectively unfounded realization that I might never be able to return to reality, that I might have opened doors in my consciousness that could never be shut. I imagined trying to live my life in this condition, and the panic just kept getting more and more intense. If I'd had a weapon nearby, I might have harmed myself. I should say that this was my first experience with hallucinogens. 
I was totally unprepared for the sheer power and magnitude of the experience. And it is true that even seasoned trippers can be totally blown away by the Salvia experience. The disorientation and the totality of the experience and my profound lack of personal control over it were terrifying. If I ever do approach Salvia again, I will do it with extreme respect and consideration for my trip factors. The dimensions I visited while under the influence seem totally real, even in retrospect.